early years, you studied Chinese in Beijing, and yeah. then you have been working in many cities in China. So for you, apart from facilitating communication, um, what do you think to master another language help you most? Well, it's a very, that's a very good question because I think the answer most people would give is that if you don't understand the language, it's difficult to understand people's culture, their history, and their literature, uh, and particularly perhaps their humor as well. So I think that is one of the issues. And for China in particular, I think a lot of people who don't speak Chinese, and in particular who do not read Chinese, can find China quite a difficult country, quite alienating, because there aren't very many familiar signs to them. Even the shops have different, you know, it's not McDonald's, it's Mai Dang Lao, and therefore they don't have some of the things that make them feel familiar. So that, I think that's what language does. What I, I think will be interesting is, as the technology for automatic translation improves, and I think Google have just come out with an automatic translator for 16 languages, I'd be interested to see in 10 years' time what the difference is between somebody who speaks two or three languages and somebody who just uses Google or artificial intelligence to speak, whether or not there still remains a cultural gap because you haven't learned the language. I think that's quite an interesting area we'll, we will explore. Uh, we also know that uh, China and the UK have many uh, corporations in the field of educational corporations. So um, as an experiencer and facilitator, so could you review with us some of the uh, corporations in the past 20 years? Yeah, that again, uh, it, it changes all the time. What we had uh, in the last 20 years began with student mobility, huge numbers of Chinese students going to the UK. Um, and I think we have now over 100,000 Chinese students in the UK. We have more Chinese mainland postgraduate students in the UK than British postgraduate students in the UK. 25% of all of our postgraduates are Chinese mainlanders, 23% are from the UK. So that's an enormous thing uh, around student mobility. And how that has changed is that 20 years ago, most of that student mobility was from China to the UK. But now we actually have 5,000 British students in China, 5,000. Now that's not as many as 100,000, but actually proportionately, because our population is about 5% of Chinese, it's the same proportion of people coming over here to study Chinese. So that's student mobility. And then the second big area is uh, actual physical campuses coming out here. Um, and you have Nottingham Ningbo University, which is very successful. You have Xi'an Tong, Liverpool University in Suzhou, also very, very successful. And that model has worked very well. And now I think we're starting to see potentially more and more Chinese schools setting up in the UK. So that's the difference there again. Here in East China, we have 27 UK-style international schools. But what we've seen in the last two years is in London, the beginnings, the openings of Chinese bilingual uh, international schools in London, which I think is very exciting. And then the final area for education collaboration or education institutional collaboration, which is becoming bigger and bigger, is research and development. And in fact, Oxford University is opening up its first ever research and development center outside of Oxford City in Suzhou. And Cambridge is opening up its first ever innovation center outside of Cambridge in Nanjing. So, and, and there are many others. So that's the direction in which we're going. More collaboration more two-way. Okay. Um, what, in your view, are the new possibilities in the UK-China educational co uh, collaborations? What aspect uh, can we enhance in the future? Well, as I said, I think what is interesting is that we are seeing much more genuine collaboration. So a model that used to be, and this isn't just in education, but it might be in culture, in trade, investment, a model that used to be uh, we bring British things to China, Chinese people bring British things to Britain, whether it's education or culture, etc. That model has shifted and has shifted in the last three years. What you're now seeing in all of those fields is genuine collaboration. So you will have a Chinese institution and a UK institution 
working together to develop a global product, a global world-beating product. Uh, and I think that is true of culture, where you might see Shanghai Media Group working with the BBC on Doctor Who. It's equally true of business, where you may have a company like GKN, which is one of our biggest engineering companies, working with Comac on, on the wide-body planes uh, that China's developing. And it's true of education, whether it's something like Nottingham Ningbo University or Shang, uh, Xi'an uh, Jiaotong, uh, or whether it's the research and development that's now going on. Most of it is collaborative, China and the UK working together to build a global brand rather than just an exchange. Um, in international education, we often mention the term leadership. So what, in your opinion, is leadership? Could you give us a specific example? Well, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to say I don't want to give you a specific example. And the reason is that I, I think quite a lot about leadership. And what I think is an issue around leadership is that we still, despite, in most, certainly in my organization, and universities are a bit different by, by, by necessity, but in my organization, we talk about leadership and different styles of leadership. But I think in reality, we still prefer a certain style of leadership quite a directive style, quite a, uh, uh, a kind of a hero leadership style of leadership. That, that, that is still preferred across large parts of government and I think large parts of business. And what I think the challenge will be genuinely is not for institutions to teach leadership, but for institutions to value different types of leaders. And for me, that will be the big question about leadership, is not how you can get everybody to learn how to be a leader, but how you can get institutions to change, to value different types of leadership, and to have leadership at all levels, to rethink what leadership means. Um, and that's, that's a huge challenge for all big institutions. Yes, I agree with this. So um, we know that climate change is a hot issue of international debate. So, um, and education on climate change is attracting people's attention. Um, we know that you worked in Beijing as the consular of the British Embassy for four years, and one of your focus is affairs on UK-China climate change cooperation. And uh, we also noted that some times ago in Shanghai, you participated in a series of activities on promoting low carbon cities. So my question is, what are your thoughts and suggestions on the education of climate change? Again, it's a very good question. I mean, we do, it's a good example of climate change of areas, actually, where the UK and China are doing that model I was talking about, genuinely collaborative. So one of the programs that we set up, actually, was with the Met Office Hadley Center. Uh, Met Office Hadley Center has some of the best science on climate. China has some of the most powerful uh, computers supercomputers. You put that together, the Met Office Science, the Chinese supercomputers, and actually now, this was a big program, about £20 million program, now the best climate science in the world is coming out from that collaboration between the Met Office and the Chinese Qi So you, you see that that's the kind of area that uh, we are working on. In terms of education, what I have found in China is that the understanding and the valuing of the basic science around climate change is more accepted and more widespread here in China actually than it is in uh, large parts of the West. And in fact, survey after survey shows that 95% of Chinese people are worried about climate change. Whereas in, say for example, in America, I think there's about 45% who don't believe in man-made climate change. In the UK, it's about 20%. So here in China in particular, uh, one of the basis of good climate education is respect for science and respect for the facts. And I think that is an, it, it is an area that we need to, uh, to work on. So you've got to get the climate science right, uh, then you need to educate people about it. And you need to educate people to trust, not to not question them, but to trust science to believe in science. I think that's an ongoing.